Pastor Jay Mansbridge here, lead pastors of Bayside Church International, based here on the south coast of South Australia. Our great passion as a church is to help people to know Jesus and to demonstrate His love, truth and life in everything that we do. We hope you enjoyed today's message. G'day. Happy New Year. New. Say new. New. Turn to 2 Corinthians. If you have a Bible with you today, I'm going to open uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible, that's right. Half of you here today are holiday makers, and uh, I hope you enjoy your time down here. It's, uh, it's <laughs> strange to think that so many people could come to church on a Sunday morning in the first weekend of summer, really, really glad that it's raining. <laughs> but today we do. Today we do. Second Corinthians, and uh, I'm going to be reading from chapter 5, a uh, fantastic passage of Scripture, and I'll read some Scripture, do what I normally do, I'll read some Scripture, maybe a bit of explanation. Uh, I'm going to go to the Old Testament and read a peculiar story there, and then I'm going to launch in to the message that my wife made me preach today. So, <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 16, from now on, therefore, from now on, if I was an inspirational type preacher, I could probably do a whole message just on those three words, from now on. They might be good words for some of us to take home, from now on, from now on. Therefore, we regard no one According to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we don't do this anymore without getting too complicated. Uh, flesh is a bit of a funny word for those of us who've never been in church before or don't read the Bible much. But it's basically his way of saying we look beyond the physical form of a person. We don't just see that person's physical form. We are able to discern more of who that person is and not just judge them according to what we see physically in front of us. There was a day where we as Western society really uh, all believe that, where we believe that skin colour and um, sex or gender, whatever we're meant to call it now, and uh, other things weren't that important, that we were to judge Martin Luther King, uh, someone according to the conduct of their character. There is a movement uh, in our world today to try to get us back to making judgments on people according to their skin colour or according to their sex or gender or physical things. Bible, Paul says here, that is a very immature way to look at people. We want to look beyond someone just in their flesh. In fact, Rob mentioned something earlier in our pre-service prayer time. Uh, he says, God has called us to be a, a transformed people or a transforming people. We're going to get to that in a moment. And he said, what does the Holy Spirit want to say to you about that? And as he said that, the kid that grew up in the 80s heard the phrase, transformers, more than meets the eye. Come on. Come on, 80s boys, you know what I'm talking about. You had the same Duna cover that I had. Transformers, <laughs> more than meets the eye. And if we would appreciate, and we'll speak about it in a moment, about who God has made us to be, that we, there is more to us than meets the eye. And Paul says, many people judged Jesus according to just what they physically saw. He didn't match up to what they expected, physically speaking. But we've learned to see beyond the flesh in Jesus to appreciate who he really is. What a great lesson we could learn. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. There's that word again, new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If anyone is in Christ. There is a sense in which the church is God's new creation collectively. It's a new body of people that the planet's never seen before. But this scripture makes it clear that if any individual receives Jesus, they individually are a new person, a new creation. I'll talk about that in a moment. The old has passed away, the new has come. All this, by the way, is from God, not our own effort. We don't make ourselves new. The type of new that the Bible's talking about here is not something that you can do. You can do. God does it for us. It's from Him who through Christ reconciled us to Himself 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus came to the earth. He was born to die. We looked at that over Christmas. He was born to die so that we could enter into a right-standing relationship with God. And having known God, God empowers us to help us show others who He is. And so I often say around here, our main purpose in life is to know Him and to show Him. As we show Him, others know Him and then are empowered to show Him. Others know Him, are empowered to show Him. This is our call in life, to know Him and to show Him. Jesus does that. Uh, His death on the cross enables us to enter into a right-standing relationship with Him. And through that relationship, His ever-present Spirit helps us to live a Christ-like life so that other people want the God that we say we serve. Because quite frankly, we don't want to misrepresent Him. Our job is to represent Jesus, represent God as who He is. That is the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. You can muse on that for a while. Not counting people's trespasses against them and entrusting to us that message of reconciliation. God not counting his sins against people because he accounted all the sin of humanity and put them onto one person on humanity's behalf. The great wonder of the cross is that God took, as it were, the great magnifying glass of human history and focused all the rays of sin and evil and seared the head of a perfectly innocent one, gathered the wrath of that sin onto one, And uh, so therefore was not counting sin against others because he counted it against one on our behalf. Why are you Christians so happy? Well, there's some good news right there, okay. Therefore, another therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. An ambassador, um, as we know, is a governmental term, okay. It's basically someone officially who's from another area. They represent another government but they're in a foreign land. So they're from here, this is where their passport's from, from this country, but they travel to this country and say, I'm an ambassador representing them, I'm here as an ambassador talking to you. This is who Paul says he is. We are Christians. We are from heaven. Our citizenship, we have a passport that says heaven written on it. We are from heaven. We are heavenly people from the citizens of heaven, the Bible says, and our job is to come to earth, as it were, and represent our government here. Again, representing ambassadors. We are here to carry a message that says that is a great place to live and that we are appealing to people who don't yet have their citizenship in heaven. So he says, we implore you on behalf of Jesus Christ, please be reconciled to God. All right, have a citizenship change, become a citizen of heaven, be reconciled to this God that created you. For our sake, he, God, made him, God made Jesus, to be sin. To be sin, wow. The one who knew no sin became sin, so that we might become righteous. Jesus did nothing to deserve becoming sin. He just said, yes. Yes, Dad, I'm willing. I accept your offer. God came to Jesus, as it were, and said, kid, kiddo, I want to give you an offer. You are perfectly pure and sinless. How about I gift you all the sin in the world and you can take that on yourself? How about you become sin? You don't deserve it, but would you accept that offer? And Jesus said, that is a cup that is almost unbearable to think of, but I'll drink it because that's God's will. And Jesus took the free gift of our sin and drank it completely so that God could come to humanity and say, you don't deserve to be made pure, but would you accept the free gift of my righteousness? Would you, who are steeped in sin, accept the gift that you don't deserve and you could never earn? I gave a free gift to Jesus at the cross and he said yes. Now I offer a free gift to you. Will you say yes to that? 
Would you be reconciled to a God of perfect holiness and therefore be able to approach the throne room of grace to find mercy and help in our time of need and our confidence as we approach a holy God is not because I've been a good Christian this week, is not because I was born with a certificate from a certain denominational church, is not because I grew up in a particular school system, is not because of who my parents were. I have confidence before God because of one thing and one thing only, Jesus. I said earlier, I said a few weeks ago, everyone wants to go to heaven, but we need to understand heaven's God's home. It makes no sense to say, I want to go to heaven, but I want to have nothing to do with the one who lives there. Yeah, let me into heaven, but I'm going to ignore the owner of the house. No, 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 no. Jesus did not even come, ultimately, that he may get people to heaven. He came so that we can get, he can get people into a relationship with the God who inhabits the heavens. Okay, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father unless they come through me. This is the wonderful reconciling work of Jesus that makes a way open for people to truly know God in uninhibited wonder and purity. And that offer is available to each of us today. And you don't deserve it. But you are worthy of it. Because God counted you worthy. God said, you are worth dying for. You're worth dying giving my life for, because I want you to be in relationship with me. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus, like it or not, he knows you. And whether you realise it or not, you do have a relationship with God. You may be ignoring him, you may be running away from him, but he is not ignoring or turning his face from you. He wants you to turn around to him and to enjoy a face-to-face, genuine relationship with him. Jesus did not come to invite us to join a religion. He came to invite us and make a way that we could enter into an eternal relationship. For this is eternal life, Jesus said, that they would know you, and that they would know the one you sent. Knowing Jesus is eternal life. And that is the most precious and beautiful thing. What could be more important than that? I could finish right there. That's a good start. (laughs) One of the wonders of the good news of what Jesus has done for us is he causes us to become new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. Now, many of you know that the Bible is a big book, it's actually 66 books, and the majority of it, some of it that was written 3,000, 2,500, whatever years ago, is, it was originally written in a language called Hebrew or ancient Hebrew. The last part of the book, I don't know, maybe 30% or 25% or something, not even that, 20, uh, is what we call the New Testament. That was written in the first century and that was written primarily in Greek when Alexander the Great uh, took over the known world, all right? Uh, he basically, what they call Hellenized, it's the Greek sort of culture, and uh, made everyone speak Greek, basically, or at least write in Greek. And the Greek word in this passage for new is the word kainos. And I only say that, not to impress you, because uh, I don't speak Greek, I've just got a computer program. <laughs> um, but the Bible uses two different words for the word new, and they have different nuances. New answers. See what I did there? They have different nuances about them. Sometimes when the Bible uses our English word new, the word is neos, and that just means a new thing in terms of time. I've got this, and then I've got this. It's, you know, I had a pizza last night, and here's the new pizza I'm having tonight. It's a new one, all right? Whatever. Uh, sometimes, though, in this context, it doesn't use the word neos. It uses another word called kainos, which doesn't mean new in time, but it means new in type. It's a whole different type of thing. All right. So uh, I've used this illustration before, but let's say you know my old man has a Nokia 3210 from the 1990s, best phone ever built. All right, he's had it for 20 years, and uh, suddenly he says, you know what? I really think for Christmas I should get a new phone. And so I hear him. I hear, oh, Dad wants a new phone. And so I go out and I get him a new phone. My brother also hears him say, I want a new phone. And so he goes and gets him a new phone. And on Dad's birthday or Christmas, whatever it is, I come out and I said, Dad, I got you a new phone. He opens the box. And as he opens it, inside that box is a brand new Nokia 3210. All right. I, I got onto eBay and I ordered him a new phone. Now, that is Neos. It's exactly what he had before, it's just new. It's just got less scratches. The buttons aren't faded, but it's exactly the same. It's just newer in terms of time. 
My other brother, who's maybe a bit wealthier than me, uh, comes to Dad in later in the day. He said, Dad, I heard you wanted a new phone. I got you a new phone. He opens the packet, and in there is the latest, you know, iPhone 11, all right? Are we up to 11 yet? I've got no idea. Uh, so he gets him a brand new phone. Now, how many of you know there's a massive difference between an iPhone and a Nokia 3210? I mean, Nokia 3210's got Snake, and I mean, that was probably the best thing ever in the 90s. But the iPhone has got internet. You can talk with people on the other side of the planet. You can do your banking. You can do almost anything. Google Maps, the whole thing. It is still a phone. But it's a whole different type of phone. And if we will rewind our clocks 20 years, go back to the 90s, and explain this type of technology. I used to sell mobile phones in the late 90s. I used to work for Vodafone. If someone had explained to me, listen, in 20-something years' time, this is the type of thing your phones are going to do, we would never have believed them. We could hardly believe it when a phone came out without an antenna. I mean, that was like, what? That's amazing. And then they put color on the screen. That was amazing. Now these things do stuff we would never have imagined. It is kainos. It is a whole new type of new. And that is the word Paul uses there when he says, you are a new creation. We're not just the old person that's had our scratches taken off. Okay, We have become a whole new creature, something entirely new. The caterpillar has become a butterfly. The caterpillar has not had a bit of a makeover and a bit of Botox in his forehead. The caterpillar has become a butterfly. It has changed into something incredible. It is a transformation of a life. Did you know that a caterpillar has many, many pairs of legs? But when it goes into the chrysalis, most of those legs dissolve and it grows only three pairs of legs when it becomes a butterfly. It goes into the chrysalis with 13 segments to its body. When it comes out, a lot of those segments dissolve and it now only has 10. It goes in with at least six pairs of eyes that can only see black and white. It comes out with three pairs of eyes that can see colour. A caterpillar does not have sexually reproductive organs. You do not have male or female caterpillars. They are neutral. Chrysalis, butterfly, comes out with all the pipes and plumbing attached, either male or female, it formed, it is a whole new creature. A caterpillar, as you know, you graze your kids like I did growing up, a hungry little caterpillar, it's got chewing jaws. Those jaws dissolve because a butterfly has a little slurpy thing, whatever it's called, and it drinks. It doesn't munch. It doesn't eat. It drinks. It's a whole new mouth that it has. The nervous system changes. The muscles, uh, not only does it grow wings, it needs muscles, obviously, to move those wings. They never existed before. All its hair is removed. Good idea. Uh, its eyes are totally, totally new. Its silk glands are removed. It is a totally different creature. The, 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 the butterfly is not a caterpillar that someone's just stuck wings on. Okay, like I've said before, it's not a caterpillar in drag. It's okay, just, just like, hello, I'm, a, I'm really a caterpillar, but here I am with my brand new colorful wings. No, it is a totally new creature, all right? It is kainos. It is a whole new thing. And that's the word Paul uses when it talks about us. When we are in Christ, we become a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Now, I understand it's a bit strange explaining that we're like a butterfly, but it's going to get weirder from here on, so don't worry about it. We've just sung a song today that says Jesus is both a lion and a lamb. So it's actually very normal for the Scriptures to talk about us in terms of animals. And that is where I am going today. Last week, I shared a word about 2020, and I explained to you how God has spoken to me about fulfilling God's purpose in our generation. I won't go into all of that. You can listen to the podcast. So a verse from David. And I explain how David, in many ways, fulfilled God's purpose in his generation because of the relationships he had in his life. Past, present, future. He valued those relationships. A few years back, I was going to start our year as a church preaching about the four foundational relationships that every human has. And they're seen in the book of Genesis. No surprise. The book of Genesis means origins. So a lot of life's issues originate or original wisdom is found there. And when you read the garden story of Adam and Eve, you see that Adam has four foundational relationships that every one of you have here today. The first relationship Adam has is with God. It's just him and God. The second relationship he has is with a garden, because God places him in the garden and gives him a job to do. The third relationship he has is with a girl, 
Because even though he had God and even though he had a garden, God still says, you're alone. It's not good for you to be alone. I'm going to give you a girl. And in chapter 3, the next chapter, he's, we see a fourth relationship and it's with a serpent. It's with an, energy, uh, an enemy. Adam had a relationship with his father, with a field, with a female or a fellow man and with a foe. And these four relationships are relationships that all of us have, whether we're good at them, whether we're not good at them, whether we're conscious of it or not. These are four foundational relationships we have. And as I was musing on this, I was in bed one morning and it just occurred to me that these four relationships correspond perfectly with the four faces that Ezekiel saw when he had a heavenly vision. He's an Old Testament prophet, 500 BC, 600 BC, something like that. He had a vision of heaven and he saw these spiritual creatures and they had four faces. Eagle, ox, man, and a lion. And it occurred to me, God has called us as heavenly creatures, new creations. He has given us, as it were, a bit of poetic license here, but he's given us four faces to do each of these relationships well. With our relationship with God, it's as if God has given us the face of an eagle, a heavenly creature that can soar with him and experience transcendent realities. In our relationship with a garden, God has given us the face of an ox that we can serve and work and create and cultivate. In our relationship with other people, God has given us the face of a man, vulnerable, emotional, face-to-face, intimate, real relationships. And in our relationship with an enemy, God has given us the face of a lion. We do not take him lying down. But God calls us and gives us the authority to roar in the face of our foe. You don't believe me? Ezekiel chapter 1. Verse 4, it's on the screen. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness around it. Fire was flashing forth continually and in the midst of the fire it was like gleaming metal. From the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. Four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces. And they also had four wings. Their legs were straight. The soles of their feet were like the sole of a cast foot. They sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides, they had human hands. The four had four faces. And they had their faces and their wings like this. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. They had the face of a lion on the right, the face of an ox on the left, the face of an eagle as well. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings. They touched other while the two covered their bodies and each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went. Wherever the spirit would go, they went. I am taking poetic license here, but my theory is simply this. As new creation spiritual beings that want to be people who follow the spirit of God, God has empowered us with these four faces. It's part of the composite makeup of who we are to face the complexities of life. Life is complex. As Wesley said, life is pain, Your Highness. 80s kid, another 80s reference, so I've got to stop that. Life is complex, but it doesn't have to be complicated. Life's complex, but it doesn't have to be complicated. And to face the complexities of the major relationships we have, God has empowered us as new creations to face those, and that's my encouragement to you today. I want to show you how this works. You okay? These four creatures have four faces. In Revelation, John sees something similar. He actually says four creatures each, and they had different faces, a man, an ox, a lion, an eagle. If you, uh, those of you from Catholic backgrounds or those of you who studied church history know that for hundreds of years, theologians have looked at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and realized that the main emphasis of Matthew is the fact that Jesus is king, which means he is the lion. And we know this because it starts off by talking about Jesus was born in the line of David. That's a kingly thing. It talks about the kingdom all the time. Kingdom, 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 kingdom. You can't help it when you read Matthew. It's Jesus, the lion. 
Mark's gospel talks about Jesus, the servant, the one who came to seek and serve. He's like the ox in Mark's gospel. In Luke's gospel, he's got the face of a man. He's born, as we saw at Christmas, into a human genealogy. He's tired, he sits down, he's thirsty, he's the face of a man. And in John's gospel, it shows us a whole different side of Jesus. Because John's gospel, for the poetic types, doesn't, um, doesn't have a nativity, doesn't talk about his human origins. John's gospel talks about Jesus' heavenly origins. It talks about the word becoming flesh. It's this mystical, poetic, up there in the cloudy type of book. That's who John is. And it's like Jesus the eagle. These creatures are not just Bible creatures. They are real creatures. And I would stake a guess that other people in other cultures have seen them. There are mystical people in many other cultures, not just Jewish culture. You look at uh, possibly the Sphinx. The Sphinx has is a lion, face of a man, wings of an eagle. Could it be that over time, other mystical people in other cultures have seen something of these creatures? They're not real because they're in the Bible. They're in the Bible because they're real. They really exist. <laughs> and Ezekiel really saw them. So that's why he wrote them down. It's possible that other people in other cultures have also seen them. And of course, as other cultures are prone to do, they end up worshipping these beasts, whereas the people of Israel knew, hang on, we don't worship what we see in heaven, we only worship God alone. You can work that one out for yourself. Here's my point. God has called you to have a relationship with him, and in order to do that, he's given you the face of an eagle. And my encouragement to you this year <clears throat> is to know that you can soar. And know and discern when it is right to extend your wings and rise with him. An eagle has the ability effortlessly, effortlessly to soar four kilometers above the earth. I've got chickens at home. My fence is this high. And they can't get over that. Now I've done something about that. Don't tell the neighbours, but I've, don't report me to the RSPCA. I've done something to help that. But they can fly, but it's a real struggle for them. They're not built to soar. They've got big bottoms, small wings. They're not designed for that, but an eagle is. An eagle is designed to effortlessly soar kilometres into the air. That is an aspect of your new creation. You are designed, it's one of the most natural things for you as a Christian, to experience the heavenly realm and heavenly places. And so Jesus, in John's Gospel, says this really weird thing to Nicodemus. And it's so strange that many of our Bibles, dare I say, actually take it out. He says this to Nicodemus. He says, listen, I've been talking to you about earthly things, but I want to say something to you now about something heavenly. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one that came down from heaven, me, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. Who is in heaven. Did you see that? Is that on the screen? Yeah, wow. No one has ever come down from there except the one who was, or no one went up there except the one that came down, who is there. Jesus says, I was there, I came down from there, I can send there, and I am there. Now, some of our Bibles take that last bit out. The Son of Man who is in heaven, because it just doesn't make sense. How can he be up there, come down, and yet still is in heaven, present tense? It's a present tense statement. Jesus on earth was still in heaven. Why? Because he was a transcendent spiritual being. Okay, Chad, we're on holidays, we've come to visit a nice church, and now you're freaking us out with all this spiritual stuff. All right. The Bible says that we are dual citizens. I mentioned this before. Some of you have two passports. How many dual citizens do we have here? Anyone a dual citizen? You, really, Louis? Where's your other passport? Switzerland. Louis has two citizenships. He's a citizen of Australia. He's a citizen of Switzerland where his bank account is, right? <laughs> now, where do you reside? Australia. Australia. Do you reside in Switzerland? 
He is a citizen in two places, but he's only a resident in one place, because Louis is a mere human being. He can't be in two places at once. He can't be in Australia and in Switzerland. He has the right to be in Australia. He has the right to be in Switzerland. But the reality is he can only be in one place at one time. Jesus, in this profound statement, says, I am from heaven and I've come down from heaven and I am in heaven. Supernatural being that goes beyond the comprehension of our pathetic minds. We need to see beyond the flesh and be willing to say, Lord, when you say in Ephesians chapter 2 that you have seated us in heavenly places, does that mean that I am actually somehow as a spirit being, I am actually in heaven now? Just write a good review on Facebook, okay? Just don't mention any of this stuff. This, <laughs> it's profound. Here's the point, Chad. If that's too heavy for you, let's, let's move on. An eagle is just at home in the trees and on the floor as he is in the heavenly places. And I want to encourage you, even if what I said doesn't make sense, because some of you are like, oh, please talk more about this. Know when sometimes you pray, you are on the earth, praying up to God, Dad, I ask this of you. And know that sometimes when you pray, you can imagine yourself in heaven, looking down on the earth, soaring above your situation, soaring above the circumstances, because you are seated in heavenly places. You are an eagle. And at times, one of the best things that you can do is put on the face of that eagle and soar in the supernatural currents of his spirit. God has given you a relationship with himself, and to empower that, he's given you the face, as it were, of an eagle. Secondly, he's given you a relationship with a garden. He's given you a job to do and a task to perform, and in order to do that, he's given you the face of an ox. I said I was going to be referring to you as animals, and, but I take this on myself, all right? The Bible actually calls a pastor... A shepherd who looks after sheep. But the Bible also calls a pastor an ox. I'm an animal. I'm an ox. And the picture, 1 Timothy 5, and the picture of an ox is one who serves and works and toils and oftentimes done so in a way that's not appreciated. That is what ministry is often like. And that is in Mark's Gospel what Jesus said of himself. He said, I didn't come to be served. I didn't come to be served. I didn't come to sit above everyone else and say, come serve me, I'm the king. No, no, no. In Mark's Gospel he says, I came to serve. I came to give my life. I came as an ox. I came to do a job. And I'm going to set my face like flint on the task that I have ahead of me and I'm going to get on with it. And sometimes one of the best things you can do to get breakthrough in your situation is put on the face of an ox and just get busy serving. Because an ox isn't that concerned with itself. It has a job to do and it gets on with it. Which is why Jesus said a really strange thing one day. When he's talking, he's talking to a crowd of people and he says to them, listen, some of you are tired and weary and you need to find rest for your souls. Some of you are emotionally tired. And he says, this is how you find rest for your soul when you're emotionally tired. He said, you take my yoke upon you, learn from me, walk with me, and it, you, it is easy and light. You read that scripture? Take my yoke upon you. Now, for many years, I always saw that as Jesus taking a yoke, which isn't the yellow part of the neck, for goodness sake, all right? A yoke is, a yoke is a, something that an ox would wear as it treaded out grain, as a, as a farmer would drive it, okay, wears it over its shoulders. And I always picture that as Jesus coming to people and saying, listen, I have a calling for you, I have something for you to do, I have a job for you to do, so here, wear this yoke, put this on. But then it occurred to me that one day, that's actually not the picture. He says, come to me and put my yoke upon you. He doesn't say, here's your yoke. Jesus is standing here, 
because a yoke was used to join two animals together. And so he says, come to me. Stand with me. Put my yoke upon you. Learn from me, he says, and walk with me. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's a call to partnership. It's a call to walk with him and work with him. So my preoccupation is not serving God and working hard for him. I work hard, but I work with him. And that's why it's easy. And that's why it's light. It's not because the task is small. It's because I'm walking with the empowered one right next to me. He's setting the pace. He's setting the tone. He's encouraging me as I go. He never leaves me or forsakes me. We are in this thing together. See, it makes sense if Jesus said, listen, you're tired and weary. Come to me and lie down in a hammock. That would have made sense. You're tired and weary. Come to me and let's enjoy a jacuzzi together. That would make sense. But he said, you're tired and weary. And the best thing sometimes you can do when you're tired and weary is work. One of the best things you can do is actually serve. It's getting your eyes off yourself and putting eyes on other people, thinking beyond yourself. Some of the most tired and weary people to be around are those who only think of themselves all the time. Because they're self-focused, they're self-centered, they're exhausted, and they're exhausting to be around. Well, sometimes one of the best ways to get energized is to get your eyes off yourself and to walk alongside Jesus and to give your life for the sake of others, something beyond yourself. Wow. And so Jesus says, one that you can find refreshing by walking and working with me. That is a picture of ministry. God has given you a task to perform. And sometimes the best thing you can do is put on the face of the ox and say, I'm just going to get on with it. And everyone said... God gives us a relationship with himself, face of an eagle. Gives us a relationship with a garden, face of the ox. Third thing, he gives us relationships with other people. And so he gives us the face of a man. To relate well to people, God has made us emotional people. We're not airy fairy eagles only. We're not just hardened oxen. We're emotional people. And to be emotional and to deal with people well face to face, that at times requires vulnerability. Adam and Eve, together, naked, vulnerability is there. And so Jesus, the Gospel of Luke, shows us that Jesus, when he went into the desert for 40 days or 40 nights, he didn't eat. And it just says there in the Gospel of Luke, he was filled with the Spirit, soaring like an eagle, goes into the desert, and he says after 40 days, he was hungry. Jesus was vulnerable. Jesus experienced weakness. And that is something that all of us experience as well. You know, sometimes Jesus, when he needed rest, he got away from the crowds and just soared with God on a mountain, just prayed. And yet other times what we see Jesus do to refresh himself is he gets his mates together And he says, let's hop on a boat and have a fishing trip. Because sometimes one of the best things, one of the answers to your breakthrough, if you're feeling weary, one of the best things you can do is worship like an eagle. Sometimes the best thing you can do is get your eyes off yourself and volunteer and serve other people. Some of the times the best thing you can do is close your Bible, turn off the worship music, don't serve others, and get some good friends around you. Go have a fishing trip. Do something blokey. Do something girly. Get with other people that you know and that love you and have that face-to-face relationship. Many years ago, a guy called Dr. Howard Hendricks did a survey in America. He found 246 pastors that had left ministry because they'd committed adultery over a two-year period. Uh, So they're all fairly recent. And he surveyed them. He wanted to find out, do a bit of research. What is, the, is there any common commonality here between these ministers that they would enter into adulterous relationships and therefore leave ministry? And he found four overwhelmingly similar things about these gentlemen. The first is that none of them claimed that they had a daily or regular time with God in worship and prayer. It was a general correlation. They did not have as it were, a regular time of soaring like an eagle and being in God's presence. But that wasn't all. He also found that 80% of them 
developed a relationship with someone in the context of their church environment that they developed an emotional attachment with first. And they did not understand the power of that emotional pull and how quickly that emotional attachment turned to taking the clothes off. It is an incredibly fast process. I've spoken to people who've been there. Secondly, they all said that they didn't have a close friend that they could talk to and be honest with during that process. They felt like they didn't have anyone that would understand that they could talk to and be with. All of them said that. And lastly, all of them said, down to a man, they said, I always thought this would never happen to me. And his approach was basically to say, listen, if you were to take out adultery insurance, would an insurance company insure you? If you say, it would never happen to me, that's actually a risky sign. If you don't have a close friend that you can say and expose and say anything to, that's actually not a good sign. And if you are happy to be alone, to develop emotional relationships and say, oh, that won't affect me, you don't understand the pull of that, that's actually not a good sign. The, the, the fact is this, of those four things, only one of them is an eagle issue. Worshipping God, spending time in His presence. Oh, all they needed to do is spend more time in His presence. Nah, nah. These men didn't understand the reality of the vulnerability of their emotional makeup. Wow. How vulnerable, how sensitive, that, the, the way that God has made us to be emotional people. And how the pull of that, the power of that, the vulnerability of that is what exposed them. Who knows what would have happened with David? David knew what it was to soar like an eagle in worship. He played the harp, man, and the anointing came on King Saul. He was a worshipper. He knew what it was to be an eagle. He knew what it was to work hard because he led the, led the armies. And yet at the time when he saw Bathsheba on the roof opposite his house, it says that it was the time when kings go to war and he wasn't at war. He stayed at home and he stayed at home and he was anxious. He was emotional. He was thinking about his men. And because of that, he was on the roof at nighttime when he should have been sleeping. Some people, I wonder whether the emotional pull that we have or even the addictive pulls that we have to certain things. I know people that have been healed of addictions by an instant heavenly moment. An old pastor of mine, Dudley Daniel, was a raging alcoholic, went to the front one day to accept Jesus and the next day went to the pub because that's just what he did. Went to the pub, drank a beer, spat it out, said, this is disgusting, give me another one. <laughs> Poured him another beer, drank it, something wrong with this, give me another one from the other tap. Suddenly, a miracle had happened and his alcoholism was broken, not because of resilience, but because God met him and just suddenly took that thing away, not touch a drink in his life. That is a miracle. That is a heavenly eagle thing. Yet it's not everyone's story. Sometimes, maybe for some of those, we find ourselves up at night. And what do you do? Well, you're looking at Bathsheba on the internet. You're finding things. And maybe the answer is, I just need to be working hard so that I sleep better at night. Because it's in the darkness of night that many times these things happen. I just need to work hard during the day, get a face of an ox, have a purpose in life. Look beyond myself. Maybe that is part of the reason for my breakthrough. Or maybe part of the answer to my breakthrough is the face of a man. That I realize I'm vulnerable. I realize I'm susceptible. And I need to get on the phone, make a phone call, sit down with a trained person. I need to sit face to face and go, you know what? I'm experiencing a pull here that I don't understand. Help me through this journey. The face of a man that is vulnerable, that is emotional, that can talk face to face. Our society would be a much better place, place if we did less Facebook and more face-to-face. -face. I'm an eagle. God has given me the ability to soar in heavenly places, but that's not the full picture. God has given me the face of an ox that I can serve and do my job, work with him. God has given me the face of a man that I can be real, honest, vulnerable, appreciate that I have weaknesses, and I need others to help me with them. And then lastly, God has given me the face 
of a lion. Because the fourth relationship that we have is we have a relationship with an enemy. And where Adam failed in taking on the serpent, Jesus shows us how to succeed. When the serpent came to Adam and said, Here, swallow this! Adam (gasps) opened his mouth and swallowed. When that same serpent came to Jesus and said, Here, swallow this! Jesus opened his mouth (gasps) and spoke. It is very hard to speak and swallow at the same time. Jesus spoke, and as many have told us over the years, sometimes the greatest weapon we have to fight our enemy is right under your nose. It's the roar of the lion that says, that's enough. It's the roar of the lion that says, the first three words I read today, from now on, it is written. This is how it is. God has given you the face of a lion. He has given you a taste for blood. He has given you a roar in your belly. And he has given you the ability to demonstrate aggression and anger in a righteous way. And Jesus demonstrates that for us. Jesus did not have anger management issues, but he sure got angry. And he sure knew how to channel that anger well. If you experience anger from time to time, let me tell you that's normal and that's natural and it's a God emotion. It's a God emotion. What we, the Bible does say, it doesn't say that there's anything wrong with anger in itself, but it does say that when you are angry, just make sure that you don't miss the mark. In your anger, the Bible says, do not sin, do not miss the mark. The Bible also says that zeal is good, passion is good, anger is can be a good thing. But zeal without knowledge is useless. Zeal not directed in an intelligent way is pointless and useless, but the lion has an ability to be strategic, to be silent, to be subtle, and to know when and where it is right to pounce and direct its aggression. We have a lot of people right now expressing anger in Australia because of our bushfire catastrophes. And sometimes it's actually not because of the bushfires that they're expressing anger at all. Some people are just addicted to outrage. Some people just love the feeling of anger because it makes them feel alive. Our kids play basketball and competition's good. It's energetic, right? But one of the worst basketball games you can ever go to with your kids is when in the first quarter, one team scored 50 points and the other team scored nothing. There is nothing worse than that because everyone's sitting there. They're bored. It's miserable. It's just nah. It's just there's no life in that. Nobody enjoys that. The winning team who are, who are slaughtering, they don't enjoy it. The losing team, the kids that don't know how to play, they don't enjoy it. The umpires don't enjoy it. The parents don't. It's like, this is a waste of time. We get bored. And we humans don't like getting bored, particularly nowadays. We've grown up being stimulated a lot. We don't get, like getting bored because bored makes us think. And a lot of people in our culture don't like stopping and thinking. We would actually rather, and a good game is where there's tension. Where there's, oh, give, take, come on, boys. When you watch a sports game, you want it to be close. You want it to be exciting. Why? Because we were designed to experience excitement and emotion. It makes us feel alive. If I'm not feeling alive, I'm feeling bored. This is like the worst thing. I don't want this. I want to feel alive. Some people live such boring lives that they find any opportunity to feel alive and be angry. That's why some people are literally addicted to being outraged at anything that happens. Now, if you've been angry at what's happening in the last week, that could be a very good thing. Because anger shows that we care. And we should be angry. It is right to be angry at certain things. But zeal without knowledge, zeal without directing that anger in a way that is constructive, is just useless and can be destructive. Jesus did not go into a temple, see something and make a hissy, kick a hissy fit. He sat down, he saw something in a temple one day, 
it stirred anger within him. He sat down and he began to make a whip. And he began to think, what's the best way for me to deal with this situation? And he stood up from that and he directed his anger in a way that is memorable. But even that, funnily enough, didn't change the people that were there. What changed the people that were there was the fact that he loved them and gave his life for them. It's fine to be angry at things. Direct it in an intelligent way. But then also understand that a lot of the time, anger actually doesn't build anything. If anger doesn't turn to compassion, it's love and it's kindness and it's compassion that actually solves issues a lot of the time. Why did I say all that? Because of the line. God, has, we have a relationship with an enemy. And sometimes one of the best things you can do is harness your anger toward him and roar at him. And that is what Jesus shows us when he said, it is written. Some of us know how to soar like an eagle. Ah. Some of us know how to serve like an ox. Some of us know how to express our vulnerability. But many of us do not know what it's like to roar at a lion, roar as a lion and roar at an enemy. You see, the Bible does say that our enemy goes around roaring like a lion. You remember that in Peter? But there is another animal that can defeat a roaring lion. And it's a bigger lion. And that's you. You are a bigger lion. And I encourage you this year, there's certain situations you will face. Like Jay said, you need to roar. You need to roar. A number of years ago, I'll finish with this. A number of years ago, we had, when God was showing me this actually, we had a teenager in our church whose mum was overseas and so grandpa came to look after her. And while grandpa was looking after her, he fell really sick, got rushed to hospital. We got a call. Grandpa's been taken to hospital. I'm on my own. And as you do when you're a pastor, you drop the phone. Jay went there, slept the night, looked after this 15-year-old girl while auntie and uncle drove from, overseas, uh, from Melbourne, got here at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning to look after her. The next day, we had a 15-hour day, massive day. Went to the city, had a big, big event on, came back. He's also, we left at like 7 o'clock in the morning, all the way northern suburbs, came back. And within 15 minutes of walking through the door with our kids, massive day in Adelaide, we get a phone call. So Grandpa's still in hospital. They've diagnosed him. He's got this massive heart issue. Uh, he's got a 20% chance of surviving the night. Tired, worn out, big day. Without thinking about it, I picked up my keys, walked out the door, and began driving up to Flinders. As I'm driving up to Flinders, it, like, it occurs to me, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> I've got nothing. This guy's going to die. This guy's got 20% chance of living. What am I doing? And I begin to worship. What started as the face of an ox, I'm going to serve. That's my job. I'm serving this family. Then had to turn into a face of an eagle as I worship for half an hour in the car and just got my head in heavenly places. I walk in the hospital room, and he's there, he's, he's got his will next to him, he's been updating his will that day, tubes in his, in his head, 15-year-old girl sitting there, we've known her since she was seven years of age, in our church, she's sitting there, and I walk straight past her and ignore her. Because by the time I got to that hospital room, I needed to put on the face of a lion. And I went straight up to Grandpa and I said, Hi. I'm actually really ticked at the moment. And he's like, are you angry at me? <laughs> uh, no, I'm angry at this thing that's trying to kill you. It is not going to kill you. And for the next minute, I sat by the bed and I didn't speak to him again. I spoke to his stomach. It was his stomach issue, not a heart issue. I spoke to his stomach and I roared at it like a lion. You get the beep, beep, beep out of this guy. And I just had that face of a lion and I spoke to that sickness. A minute later, whoosh, face of a man. I go to the granddaughter and I hug her. She's crying. I'm gentle with her. Uncle and auntie are there. I talk with her, make arrangements. How can we bring, what can we do? How can we help you? Etc. etc. The next day, they phone me. They say, look, they couldn't get him into an operation. They've delayed it to tonight. The next day, they said, they've just checked him. He doesn't need an operation. And the following day, they said, he's 100% fine. He can come home. 
from 20% chance of dying to a two days later, three days later, whatever it is, he was fine. We have what it takes. And sometimes, oops, sometimes the answer to the complexity of life is that you soar like an eagle. Sometimes the answer is you just put on the face of an ox, you just get on with the job. Sometimes the answer is that face-to-face, vulnerable, intimate, genuine relationship with people, care. And sometimes we need to roar like a lion. And Jesus, Chad's an okay example, but Jesus is the greatest example. Jesus is the greatest example. And the greatest example at the cross, the one who knew what it was to soar like an eagle and knew his Father's will. He knew why he had come. He knew heaven's agenda. And so he said, I'm going to go to the cross. The next moment we see Jesus in a garden and he is weeping. He is crying. The the emotional weight of what he is facing is gripping him. And he says to his mates, he gets his three best mates around and he says, boys, be with me at this time. This this is really a crappy situation right now. I don't know. I I, I can barely handle this. I need my mates to be with me. We see the face of the man in Jesus. The next moment he's arrested and he's walking through the city. They put a cross on his back and he walks through the city with a cross on his back. People spit on him. The very people he is serving scorn him. The very people that he is giving his life for spit on him and yet he sets his face like an ox and just says, I'm getting on the job or with the job, whether they know it or not, whether I'm appreciated or not, I'm going to get on with it because I'm here to serve these people. And then on the cross, we see Jesus the lion. Because the cross, when Jesus died, it was not his weakest moment. It was his strongest moment. On the cross, it says, as he breathed his last, it says he raised a loud voice or a a large voice. The word in the Greek is mega, (laughs) M-E-G-A-S, mega. He raised a mega voice when he said, it is finished. And it was not a voice, it was not a whimpering voice. Jesus was not on the cross going, (laughs) in his last breath. He declared a a victorious roar like a lion, because he knew the enemy was being conquered. Jesus, the lion, hung on that cross. Jesus demonstrates the complexity of life. Because we're not going to get up and say, you know, I want. we should be encouraged as we start a new year, because encouragement's really important. But if God says to us, we need to develop a roar, there's a reason for that. It means that it's not a tiptoe through the tulips year. You don't need a roar if it's tiptoe through the tulips. You don't need God to tell you, I'm going to give you joy. Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. If God says you need joy, it's probably because you need to be strong for something. (laughs) So there's no, you know, idealism here. We have complex lives. We face complex issues. But God has given you the goods to face it all. You have what it takes. God has made you, if you're in Christ today, God has made you a new creation. He's reconciled you to himself. He's created you to be a whole new creature. And he's given you the goods to face the complexities of life. Life doesn't have to be complicated, but it will always be complex. The good news is God has given you the goods. The face of an eagle at times, the face of an ox, at times, the face of a man. And at times, let your internal lion raw. You are who you are because Jesus is who he is. And I think it would be appropriate to finish today, not with our eyes on us, but to finish with our eyes on him. I hope you've enjoyed today's message. Remember to check us out at baysidechurch.org.au. And of course, if you're ever in the area, please pop in and say good day.